We're running through the best cinematic video settings for the Sony ZV-E10. We're gonna look at three common shots. A locked off talking head style shot, what the best settings are for that. Then we're gonna go into the best settings for a vlog style video. And lastly, slow motion cinematic footage. This little camera has become extremely popular amongst online content creators for its fantastic video quality at a really affordable price. But like anything, to get the most out of it, we gotta get our settings just right. I'm gonna show you exactly what has worked best for me. And while we're going through this, I'd encourage you to have your ZV-E10 with you so you can follow along and save this video because what's gonna happen, you're gonna go out there, start shooting, might forget a few things, might wanna come back and make sure that you got everything lined up just right. We're breaking this video down into four very easy to follow sections. The first one is gonna be the global settings. Number two is going to be the locked off talking head style shot. The third one will be the vlog style shot. And lastly, number four is going to be that slow motion cinematic footage. For the global settings, I'm gonna show you everything I change in the menu system for this camera. If I don't talk about it or don't change it, that's because I leave it as default in terms of how it came out of the box. And these settings that I show you right now, these are gonna be ones that I have set regardless of what style of shot that I'm doing. And then when we get into each of those styles of shot, all three of those, locked off, talking head, vlog style, and cinematic B-roll, I'll talk specifically about what settings I change for those. All right, as we go through this, these things up top, I'm gonna to refer to these as tabs. And then down here, these are gonna be different pages. So example here would be tab one, page four, tab one, page three, tab two, page one, tab two, page two, just some terminology there. First things first, you wanna make sure your camera's in video mode. You can toggle up top using this button and you'll cycle from photo to video to S and Q. For now, make sure we're in video. Tab one, page four, make sure that our focus mode is in continuous autofocus. The autofocus in this camera is extremely reliable, but if you wanna to toggle between manual and auto, this is where you do it. Focus area, we want this as wide for now. This is something that will change quite frequently for different style of shots. Just leave it as wide for now. Focus area limit. I actually uncheck a few of these, but I'll show you what's going on here. So when I choose different focus modes in my camera, it's gonna show me every single one that I had selected there. I don't use all of those, so what I'll typically do, just to save some time when I'm cycling through that, I get rid of center and then all three of these spots and I just leave on wide, zone, and then this expand flexible spot. And my touch tracking, I have that correlated to the same ones that I have available. Hit okay to save that. So that way when I go through and I'm actually looking at my types of focus, it's just gonna cycle through the ones that I had there, which just saves me time because I don't use the other ones. Let's go through what each of these style of focuses do. Wide, the camera's gonna use the entire frame to find what it wants to focus on. We can set it to prioritize eyes and faces. I'll show you how to turn that on in just a second, but in short, it uses the entire frame. And if I go to zone, I can choose the area of the frame that the camera is gonna use to get focus. So maybe I only want it to grab focus directly where that box is outlined. I only want it to use focus in those sections. And then lastly, if I go to that expand flexible spot, I can tell the camera where I want it to focus. And it's gonna choose that inside box and then it's gonna expand just slightly outside of it just in case we have a subject that's barely outside of where we set our focus point. Still on tab one, page four, face eye autofocus settings. So so here we can tell the camera by turning this on that we want it to prioritize faces or eyes when they're in frame. I keep mine set to human. I don't care which side it selects in terms of the eye. And then we want it to show the face and eye frame display, which is this box that you see around an eye or a face. And then if you want your animal eye, you can keep that on there as well. Tab one, page six, exposure comp. We're gonna be changing this when we show our vlog style shot, but in the menu, this is where you find it. This is our ISO setting. Oh, you'll use this all the time. And and this is how you can brighten or darken your image. Increasing the ISO will brighten the image. It's a good rule of thumb to try to keep it as low as possible, but you will have to bring it up pretty often. I found with this camera that if you get much over 3200 on the ISO, you're starting to flirt with an unusable image. As you can see here, when we start to increase the ISO a lot, we're gonna add in some noise into the image and ultimately soften it and make it pretty close to unusable. So 3200 is what I found to be about the limit that I'll take this camera. Tab one, page eight, white balance. You're gonna use one of two settings for the most part here. Auto white balance, you'll use that when you don't know the temperature of your light source or the temperature of the scene. You just wanna have the camera set it on auto and get as close as possible. 
or you'll use this one down here, which is the C temp filter. You'll use this to adjust your white balance if you know your key light, for example. So I know that most key lights are gonna be 5600, so I'll match my white balance to be 5600 to match my key light. Priority set and auto white balance. These three options are gonna slightly adjust the colors that the camera is gonna be producing. I've found for Sony cameras, I like the way auto white balance white looks the best, but you can play with that and see what works for you. Picture profile. There is no shortage of discussion on the internet about what Sony picture profile is best. And there's a lot of cool options here, but what I can tell you is that leaving picture profile off, especially when you're first starting out and getting really good and not worrying about picture profiles, getting really good at white balance, focus, exposure, frame rates. These are things that are gonna make your image look really crisp and really good. And then once you get and you master that, then you can start to add in different picture profiles and start to stylize your image a little bit more. But when you're starting out, just leave this off. Tab one, page nine, soft skin effect. I keep this off, I think it looks a little bit too fake, but if you wanna try it, I would say, if anything, use low. When you start to get to high or mid, I think it just makes that effect a little bit worse. So if anything, low, but you can test that out. I typically leave it off. Tab one, page 11, product showcase. This is a really cool feature that this camera does. I'd encourage you to have that on. When you hold a product up in front of your face, it'll prioritize focus on that product. And when you get it out of frame, it'll prioritize back to the face. It's pretty cool. The problem, if you don't have this on and you're trying to show a product, is it will usually lock onto your face and you'll hold the product up and it'll be blurry in front. So this is a cool setting to leave on. Tab two, page one, shoot mode. I'm in manual. I'd encourage you to do the same. When you're in manual, you have complete control over your shutter speed or your aperture as well well as your ISO. Another option here is gonna be the intelligent auto. In intelligent auto, the camera's making all of the exposure decisions for you. You don't have control over things like shutter speed and ISO and aperture. One thing you can do when you're in this mode though, the C1 button up top, when you tap that, it will actually defocus the background and make that blurry background for you. All it's really doing there is bringing the aperture up as possible or the lowest number possible, which will give you the most capability to defocus or make blur in the background. It's doing the same thing. But that's a pretty cool feature that it does. And intelligent auto when you're first starting out can be a good option Option to get a good looking image. But I gotta tell you this, think of intelligent auto like training wheels. At some point, they're good to learn, but at some point you gotta rip them off, you gotta take a few falls and learn from that pain of how to get the most out of this camera and quote unquote go faster, back on the training wheels analogy. Yes, initially, in the very beginning, intelligent auto is gonna give you a better looking image quality out of this camera. But over time, you're gonna be limited and manual is gonna give you a lot more potential to get a better looking image because you have full control. Still on tab two, page one, file format. This will give you the ability to switch from 4K to HD. You wanna be in 4K. I'm in HD for this entire video because my screen recorder here, it doesn't allow me to be in 4K and still see the screen. So I'm in HD, but you should be in 4K. Record setting. You'll have frame rate options between 24 and 30 when you're in 4K. 24p is a little more traditional. 30p is something you can try. I prefer 24p most of the time. And you also wanna choose the highest meg rate possible. Tab two, page two, autofocus transition speed and autofocus subject shift sensitivity. These are two that we'll talk a lot about in the next sections in this video, but here's where you find those. And then moving on to audio recording, make sure your audio recording is on so that the camera is actually recording audio. Audio record level, we're on tab two, page three. This is how you can increase or decrease the amount of gain that the camera is picking up from the audio source. When you're recording audio, you want those meters down below to be bouncing the audio. Let me just turn this up to see if I can get it to show you. You want the audio to be bouncing between negative 12 and negative two, that's gonna be a good place to record audio. You don't wanna be having the audio peaking and hitting that red way up there because that's called, like I just said, peaked audio. It's really hard to recover in post. But when you record your audio between like negative 12 and negative two, somewhere in here, you can bring it up in post and get a really nice sounding track. Audio level display, you want that on. That's what we're looking at back here in the bottom right. That's the audio level displays of the meters of the audio and how high or how low it's bouncing. Wind noise reduction, I set that to off. I don't want the camera guessing and potentially botching my audio if there's wind. If you're recording in wind, make sure you use the supplied dead cat that comes with the camera or if you're using an external mic, make sure you put a dead cat on there as well. Steady shot, we'll be talking a lot about these for the different types of videos that we're doing, but this is where you access that setting. Tab two, page four, 
emphasis display during record set that to on that's what's going to give you these red tally lights around the frame to show you that you're recording and then record lamp set that to on that's the red light in front of the camera both of those things being important to ensure the fact that you know you're recording because there's red everywhere you can't miss it no you're not seeing things i forgot a shot it happens these are really complicated tab two page seven zebra display i'll spend a lot of time talking about this Zebra display, we can toggle our zebras on or off. And on the back of the screen, when they're on, when the camera hits a certain exposure, they'll start to appear. So make sure those are set to on. And then zebra level can be adjusted as well. Much more on that later. I do have a lot of these custom maps, but I wanted to show you where they lived in the menu. Tab two, page eight, custom keys for video. You can actually, in the highlight, when I'm cycling through, you can see that orange highlight on the camera there that is suggesting which button these are attached to on the camera. You can completely customize these, how they come out of the box. And when you customize these, you can be a lot more efficient. Essentially, when you're shooting, these are the ones that you visit very frequently and settings that you change a lot. Here's how I have mine set. Button one, I set that to ISO. Again, we change that frequently. Number two, my zebra display select. And real quick, how you map these, you just click it, find the menu item you wanna do, and then you're just gonna set it just like that by clicking the center button on the camera. So number one, I have to ISO. Number two, I have zebra display select. We'll talk a lot about all my settings in these future kind of sections we're gonna be going through, but this is how I have mine set so that you're aware of that. Push left on my dial brings up my zebra levels. Pushing right brings up my white balance and pushing down brings up my picture profile. Up on top here, product showcase set. I like to be able to toggle that on and off very quickly. So that's how I have that set. And then I leave this one, the red button up top set to movie settings. Function menu settings. Similarly, these down here, we're talking about video today. If the if certain settings didn't make the cut for being my custom keys, then they fall into the function menu. Ones that I still visit quite frequently. And there's a little bit of redundancy here. I have a couple of duplicates here for my custom keys, but ones that didn't make the custom keys that I still use a lot, I want to have access to them quickly simply by tapping the function menu on the back of the camera, it'll bring these up. My first one, I have my audio record level. I then have my two autofocus transition speeds, similar to the custom keys to change these, just select the box you want, find the menu item you wanna map it to and click the center key and it will map it there. So both of my autofocus settings here, my exposure compensation, this is my ISO. When it says follow function menu, it's just following the same function I have set for photo. This is my, you can look up top here, this is my focus area. And then I'll have this one here for my shoot mode my picture profile, again, some redundancy. This is my face, eye, priority, and autofocus. Sometimes I wanna to toggle that off. My white balance, my soft skin effect, and then all of my steady shot settings. Tab three, page one, airplane mode. I turn that on. The only time you'll want that off is if you wanna connect your smartphone to your camera, which is, here's how you do that. You just go into this setting and follow the prompts. But I keep airplane mode on because I want to try to save as much battery as possible with this camera. It doesn't have the, the best battery life. It's not terrible, but it's not great. So the more that I can do to maximize a battery, I'm gonna do. So my air Airplane mode is on, it kills the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. If you need your Bluetooth on to connect the smartphone, you just turn airplane mode off and that's how you do that. Tab five, page one, power setting option. Power save start time. This is how long it takes for the camera to go to sleep after it's not being used. I set this to off, but if you prefer your camera to turn off because you're bad at turning it off, then you can change one of those that you see fit. And then auto power off temperature. I set this to high. It'll come out of the box as standard. When you click high, you'll get this warning that makes it sound like the camera's gonna break at some point. When the camera gets warm, it'll just stop recording. So when you set it to high, it'll increase the amount of time until that occurs. I've always had my Sony cameras set to high and I've never had any issues. Tab six up here, my menu. You can customize menu items that you visit frequently. So you don't have to go find them in that crazy menu and you can just lock them in right here. How you do that is you just go over to the add item. You find the menu item that you want. Let's say I want monitor brightness and then you choose where you wanna put it, hit the center button and it will add to your menu. And you can see that that just happened right there. If you're getting something from this video, let me know by giving it a tap on the thumbs up. And while you're down there, let me know in the comments, why did you get the ZV-E10? What are you planning on shooting? I'd be curious to know. I've got something for you. We're about to go through some fairly intricate settings for each of these style of shots. So I put together a checklist that you can go through when you're about to shoot so that you are automatic in getting these settings just right. It's a link down below. It's completely free. Add your email and that checklist is all yours. As we go through these different style of shots, I'm going to access some of these settings via my function menu and custom keys, but they're the same settings that we've already reviewed in the menu. So if you prefer to find them that way, that's totally fine. Locked off talking head. 
This locked off term just means that the camera is locked off on a tripod and talking head means it's a static shot just like this. It's a common shot for YouTube or interviews and it's one that you can make look really good with this camera, but yes, you gotta get the settings just right, so let's look at that. First thing we wanna do for file format, make sure that is in 4K. Again, I'll be in HD only for today. And then record setting, we want 24p at the highest meg rate possible. In 4K, that should be 24p at 100 megs. Focus area. I have that in zone for this style of shot and I'll typically put that zone wherever the subject is. If it's a center shot, the zone will be directly in the center. And I do that as opposed to wide just in case there happens to be more than one person in the shot or people in the background or people passing through. I want to try to limit the camera guessing where to focus by simply putting that zone directly around the subject, the main subject of the shot. Focus speeds. I turn these all the way down for this style of shot, both the autofocus transition speed and the autofocus subject shift sensitivity. I turn that to locked on. So both of those as low as possible. That's so that the camera is gonna lock on the focus on the subject and it's gonna be hard for it to lock onto something else. Also, when these are cranked up too high, What'll happen with some lenses on the camera is that you'll get this like annoying pulsing that's gonna be happening on the edges of the frame. And I found that the best way to mitigate that is to turn both of these as low as possible so you don't have to worry about it. Trust me on this one, I've done a lot of this style of shot with those exact settings and the autofocus is gonna keep up plenty fast with a static style subject like this. White balance, I'll usually lock that off at 5600 if I know I have a key light like I do here that's a 5600 Kelvin key light. If I happen to not know the scene's temperature setting, I will put this in auto and let the camera do the work. The downside to auto is that the colors might shift a little bit throughout the scene. It won't be anything rapid, but that is the downside. So the best thing, if you can lock it off and you know the light source is Kelvin setting, that's the best way to do it. But auto, generally speaking, works just fine. Stabilization or steady shot. For a locked off style of shot, we don't need the camera to have any stabilization. So I'll set this to standard, but nine times out of 10, I just set it to off. For exposure, I use a method called zebras. I have a very detailed video on my channel about exactly how to expose using zebras. I found it to be the most consistent way to get good exposure. But in the camera, I access my zebra levels. I have that custom map to left on my dial as we reviewed earlier. I set my zebra levels and then I have this toggle switch, the center button. Again, we looked at that in the custom menu section to make sure my zebra display is set to on so that I can actually see the zebras. Let's say that this gray external drive is something I wanna expose. And let's just say it's a skin tone. So what I would do is I would set my zebra level to 70, make sure my zebra display is turned on. For this shot, I'm in 24p, so I wanna lock off my shutter at double my frame rate. That's a good rule of thumb for video. So one over 50 is as close as this camera can get to double the frame rate, the frame rate being 24p. So one over 50. After after I do that, I'm going to get my aperture to my desirable number, typically as low as possible, not always. And then what I'll do is I'm just gonna change my ISO by bringing it up until zebras start to appear on that gray SSD card. Once they start to appear, I'll pull back one stop. That is going to be my exposure for the shot. And when you get it right, you're left with something that looks like this. Shot on the ZV-E10, which I think does an outstanding job for this style of shot. And this is shot with a kit lens. For our vlog settings, you're gonna see a lot of similarities to what we just ran through with the locked off talking head style of shot, but there are a few small changes that make a pretty big difference. So let's take a look at that. First thing, file format, same thing. We want that to be in 4K. Record setting, same, 24 at the highest meg rate. Unless you prefer 30, you can do that. Focus area, I also use zone here. Typically when I'm vlogging, you'd be right in the center of the frame for the same reasons as before. We don't want the camera to use other aspects of the frame to try to get focus, especially if there are people in the background, which when you're vlogging, the odds of that are very high. So set it right in the middle. Focus speeds, I keep these as low as possible, just like before for all of the same reasons. Stabilization, this will be different than what we just talked about earlier. The problem when you go to active, the good thing is that the stabilization, the shot will be a lot smoother. And when you're vlogging, that can be important. Important. The problem is that it's also gonna crop in pretty heavily. 
which is fine if you have a wide enough lens on the camera. I can tell you that the kit lens is not quite wide enough. I think it's wide, yeah, it's widest to 16 millimeters. You're gonna want something like the Sony 10 to 18 or maybe the 11 millimeter prime. Those are things that when you put it into active and it crops in, it's still a wide enough shot to where it works for a vlog. If you don't have a wide enough lens, maybe you're running the kit lens, I encourage you to use standard. It's not gonna be quite as smooth as active, but there's no crop and I think it's completely usable. And in like 30 seconds, I'll show you that because I'm gonna do a vlog style shot. So you'll see standard stabilization. For exposure, this is something that I do a little bit differently for vlogging. Because the lighting is usually dynamic, it's changing as I'm walking around, I can't necessarily lock off the exposure. What I do is I set my shutter speed to be double my frame rate just like before. I'll set my aperture typically, again, as low as possible. This lens goes to 3.5. And then for ISO, I'm gonna put that in auto. And then I'm gonna have the camera take care of exposure for me. How I do that is back on my function menu, I've mapped this, but my exposure compensation, I'm gonna turn this up to 0.3 and the camera is gonna get exposure from there and it usually does a pretty good job. And if you get your settings right, your vlog is gonna look something like this. I've got a lot of videos on the channel about the ZV E10 and much more to come. So if you're digging this one, tap the subscribe down below. Let's get into the next section of the cinematic slow motion. This camera performs really well for slow motion cinematic style shots. But just like before, we gotta get the settings tuned up to make sure that we get the best image possible. So let's look at that. The first thing, we're gonna use the button up top here to cycle from video over to s &Q. and once we're in s &Q, over here on tab two, page one, my s &Q settings, to get good slow motion, you have a few options here. The first thing, your record setting. If you're filming the majority of your footage in 30, then you wanna change this to 30. I have mine in 24. And then for frame rate, you have two slow motion settings. 120 is gonna be the slowest slow motion. I typically shoot most of my slow motion in 60. I think it works just fine. The problem with 120 in this camera, it's really nice and it works. The problem with 120 in this camera, I'm in 120 right now. If I go to stabilization, I don't have active. And typically when I'm shooting slow motion, not always, I'm doing handheld. So having active stabilization can make for a smoother shot. So when I'm in my S and Q settings, I change my frame rate to 60p. And once I'm in 60p, back here for my stabilization, I set that to active. Yes, it crops in, but I can work with that just fine. For my focus area for slow motion, I set this to wide and I'll usually use touch tracking and touch the subject on the back of the screen to use the entire frame to track. Usually slow motion stuff or using a lot of the frame and it's usually a fast moving subject. On that fast moving subject topic, I crank my transition speed for autofocus as well as my autofocus subject shift sensor sensitivity, that's really hard to say five times fast, I crank that as well. Typically it's fast moving subjects for slow motion, so we want the autofocus to be able to be really fast to keep up with that. And because it's slow motion, you're not gonna have that pulsing effect that could happen if those are cranked up in a vlog or a locked off talking head shot. White balance, same as before. If I know my key light settings, I'll have that locked off right at like 5600 or whatever else the Kelvin setting is for that. That key light or light source, but most times in slow motion, I'm in auto white balance. They're usually shorter clips and the lighting isn't gonna change and the temperatures aren't gonna change that much in like a three to five second clips. I'm usually in auto. And for exposure, I use zebras here as well, same method as previously, except for the only difference here is because I'm shooting in 60p, and if you're in 120p, you'll bring this to 250, but I'm in 60p, so I bring my shutter up to one over 125, so lock that in to be double the frame rate, and it says 24 up top. One thing I just noticed in S and Q as well, when I was talking about the shutter speed being at one over 125, if you look on the like, below and to the left, of our frame rate up top, it shows that we're shooting in 60 FPS. We wanna double our frame rate with that one over 125. One thing that can be kind of annoying with all these settings is having to change everything around all the time. The good news for you is there's actually a way to completely mitigate that and save a tremendous amount of time. The even better news, I just finished a video about it that you can check out here. It saves a ton of time for jumping between all of these settings and nobody is talking about it. Anyways, that's gonna do it for me. Take care. See ya.